Good morning, Destiny Fellowship. Welcome. We're excited as we begin a new series today. Uh, we're excited that this is Sunday. This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Uh, we want to take some time and encourage you, as we do every week, to get a Bible, get a notepad, put aside any distractions so that we can receive the word of the Lord. As I mentioned earlier, uh, we're excited as we begin a new series today. We're going to be talking about the parables of the Lord Jesus Christ. We have prayerfully uh, chosen this topic because, as we'll see in the next couple of weeks, parables contain not just spiritual truths, but they contain many end-time truths. And I don't know about you, I'm convinced from a biblical perspective and even from a practical perspective that we are, in fact, living in the last days. And so today we're going to begin with what we would call the most foundational, fundamental of parables. It is the parable of the sower. And so in just a few moments, we're going to be reading out of Matthew chapter 13. I want to encourage you to turn there with me. And as you're doing this, again, if you haven't liked the stream, would you do that? Would you share the stream so that we can reach as many people as possible? Uh, again, we are in Matthew 13. We're going to read verses 3 through 8. Matthew 13, verses 3 through 8. It says, And he spoke many things to them in parables, saying, Behold, the sower went out to sow. As he sowed, some seeds fell beside the road, and the birds came and ate them up. Verse 5 says, Others fell on stony places where they did not have much soil, and immediately they sprang up because they had no depth of soil. But when the sun had risen, they were scorched, and because they had no root, they were withered away. Others fell among thorns, and the thorns came and choked them out. Verse 8 says, And others fell on the good soil and yielded a crop, some a hundredfold, some sixty, and some thirty. I want to preach this morning using as a subject, check your heart. I need somebody to put that in the comment section, please. Check your heart. As we begin this series on the parables of Christ, we're starting with the parable of the sower for several reasons. First of all, it's one of the few parables that is included in all three of the synoptic gospels. It's found in Matthew 13, it's found in Mark 4, and it's found in Luke chapter 8. As we often say in our class on hermeneutics, if Jesus says it one time, it's important. If he says it twice, we need to make sure we're listening. This parable is repeated three times. We also are focusing and starting on this parable uh, because in Mark chapter 4, in verse 13, the disciples didn't understand this parable. And Jesus said something to them very interesting. He says, if you do not understand the parable of the sower, how will you understand all of the other parables? And so most scholars interpret that verse to mean that understanding the parable of the sower is the key to unlocking many of the other parables of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so throughout all of these parables, we'll see some of these metaphors and some of these pictures that will carry over into the other parables. For example, we see in this parable, a man goes out to sow seed. And in Luke's account, I love it, in Luke chapter 8 and verse 11, he says a powerful short sentence as Jesus begins to explain this parable to the disciples. He simply says, watch this, the seed is the word of God. Let me say that again. The seed is the word of God. And so of all of the metaphors we have in the Bible of God's word, we know that the word is a two-edged sword. We know that the word of God is like bread. We know the word is like milk. But here we see that the word of God is a seed. Why a seed? Uh, because a seed has life in itself. A seed contains life. And under the right circumstances, a seed can bring forth an incredible harvest. And so it is with the Word of God. For this reason, 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 23, he says that we have not been redeemed with corruptible seed, but we have been saved. We have been set free. We have been redeemed, watch this, with the incorruptible seed of God. 
of God's word, of his living word. What that means for us, watch this, is that the word of God is a seed that God deposits in our hearts that he might bring forth a harvest in our lives. So if the seed is God's word, then as we've already alluded to, that means that the soil is emblematic of our hearts. In fact, in this parable, we'll see four conditions of the human heart. As we travel through these four conditions, I want you to check your heart. I want us to evaluate this morning what what kind of soil, what kind of ground are we? If you're ready, let's get into this. Come on. The first Uh, soil that the Lord explains. He says that as the farmer is sowing, some of the seed fell on the wayside. Other translations call it the roadside, or or some will call it the path. I think the better translation is path. You see, in those days, if you're a farmer and you have a large field, they would oftentimes create a walkway or a pathway right in the center of the field for public use, so that if somebody had to cross over your land instead of them walking through your crops, they would walk on that way path or pathway. Uh, We often see that many times the farmer would use this same walkway as he was walking through the field so that he could scatter seed to the right and to the left. And as he was uh, spreading this seed every now and then, some of that seed would fall on the pathway which as it fell, the moment it would fall, birds would be quick to swoop in and snatch up that seed. That's why the Lord explains in this parable, if you'll notice in verse 19, he begins to give the explanation. Again, if you're just joining us, we're in Matthew 13 and verse 19. He explains that the bird is a picture of our adversary. I believe it's Mark's account that simply names him and says the bird is a picture of Satan. Because we understand that his M.O. is to steal, kill, and destroy. And even right now, as you are receiving God's word and receiving the seed of the word of God that God is wanting to plant and sow into your life, guess what? There is an adversary that desires nothing more than to rob you of God's word that he has planted on the inside of you. My wife and I have been pastors since 2004. And we can testify that we have seen over and over again that if we're not careful, it doesn't take too long for the enemy to snatch up the word of God that has just been deposited in somebody's life. Come on, this is Sunday morning. You're receiving the word of God. The Bible says faith comes by hearing and receiving the word of God. But every now and then you'll just have one of those weeks where by Tuesday, by Wednesday, it seems like the thief has already stolen the seed that you just received. If we're being real, sometimes it's just a few hours after service. Or we're being really honest, sometimes you can have a good service in church, you can have your hands raised, you can rejoice in the presence of God, and sometimes you don't even make it out the parking lot before the thief has already started to steal the word that has just been deposited deposited in you. But I want you to understand today, you don't have to be afraid, you don't have to be fearful, because it's not that the adversary... It's not that Satan can just steal the word anytime he wants to. If you look carefully at Christ's explanation, he explains that the wayside is a picture of those who don't believe the word and don't understand the word. Let me say that again. According to Christ's explanation of the wayside, he says this only happens when you don't believe the word and when you choose to not understand the word. When we do that, we open up an opportunity for the thief to come in and snatch up the word that has been deposited in us. You see, nothing can grow on that pathway because it's hard ground. It's been walked on so many times that the dirt is now compacted. It's been trodden over the, under the foot of men so that now nothing can grow, nothing can produce there. And so the question is, what is the answer? What is the remedy? How do we guard our heart and make sure that we don't have a wayside kind of heart? One of my favorite verses is, uh, verses is found in Hosea chapter 10 and verse 12. Let me say that again. Hosea 10 verse 12. He says, sow to yourselves in righteousness, reap in mercy. Watch this. Break up your fallow ground for it is time to seek the Lord 
until he comes and rains righteousness on us. Uh, what is the answer for a wayside heart? It's breaking up fallow ground. How do you do that? By seeking the Lord. I want to encourage you, even right now, as you're, you're receiving the word of God, you're, you're seeking the Lord. What are you doing? You're breaking up fallow ground so that his word can be rooted and growing and germinating and producing a harvest in our life. The second example that Christ gives, he says, some of the seed fell on the wayside. He says, some of the seed fell on stony places. We're in Matthew 13 and verse 20. Now, notice specifically what he says. He says, these are people that receive the word of God with joy. Here's the problem. But they have no root. Let me say that again. They receive the word with joy, but they have no root. I can't tell you how many times in scripture over and over again, we are reminded to be planted. Uh, Psalm chapter one, we are to be planted by the rivers of water. In Ephesians chapter 3, Paul says that we are to be rooted and grounded in love. We are to be rooted. And here's the thing about roots, my dear brothers and sisters. Roots by themselves are not attractive. It's the flower that is attractive. It's the fruit that is inviting. It's the fruit that is pretty. You never walk into a florist shop and ask for a bouquet of roots because roots are not attractive. But, but roots have a specific job. And what I've come to understand is that if you want fruit, you have to have root. It sounds better when it rhymes, doesn't it? Let me say that again. If you want fruit, you have to have root. And there's many believers that sincerely want to have a relationship with God, but they don't have any fruit simply because they haven't taken the time to let, to let their roots dig deep down into the ground. You see, the job of the roots is that they are to be an extension of the plant that underneath the surface, what are they doing? They're holding on. They're providing a foundation. They're, they're providing stability. No wonder Paul explained in 1 Corinthians 15 that we are to be steadfast, immovable, and always abounding in the work of the Lord. I think God is looking for a people that are rooted in him, rooted in his word, rooted in his presence, rooted in the kingdom. We've had too many wishy-washy Christians for too long, too, too many gummy bear Christians, if you will. And I think God is bringing us to a place where in this season that we're living in, 2020 has exposed our roots or our lack thereof. I've often heard Christians say or heard people say, well, I tried serving God or I tried being a Christian. And, and again, many, many times in those occasions, the truth is they, they really didn't try. They went to maybe three or four church services. They, they weren't being discipled by anyone, really didn't pray, really didn't take time to read the word of God. What happened? You didn't allow your roots to grow. Again, if there is no root, there can be no fruit. In Mark's account, in Mark chapter 4 and verse 17, he says something very alarming. He says it was only temporary. When he describes their experience with the gospel, when he describes their experience with the presence of God, their encounter with God, he says it was only temporary. In other words, their interest in spiritual matters, it was only temporary. Their commitment to God's house, it was only temporary. Their, their attempt at getting into the word of God and trying to pray and grow a relationship with God, it was only temporary. But I believe God is raising up a people that say, look, this isn't a fad. This isn't just a trend. I'm not just going through something. I'm not testing this out. I'm here to stay. This is something permanent. This is a lifelong commitment to have a relationship with my creator. So notice some of the seed fell on the stony places. And as Jesus is explaining the parable, he says, if it doesn't have any root, when the sun begins to shine, it says the sun scorches the seed and it dies. Now, all of us understand that plants need sunlight to grow. Is it not significant or ironic that if those same plants don't have roots, the same sunlight that gives them life can be the same sunlight that destroys it? 
What does that mean? Well, in Christ's interpretation of it, you'll see in verse 20, he explains that the sunlight is a picture of affliction in life persecution as a believer, or what you and I would simply call tough times. Affliction is the sunlight that can either help you grow or it will destroy you. What's the difference? The difference is if you have roots, afflictions will help you grow. If you have roots, 2020 is actually making you stronger. If you don't have roots, then what happens? Affliction begins to uproot you and you are scorched and the seed dies. So notice in the parable, he's got four conditions of the heart. We see the wayside. We've seen the stony places. Here's our third one. He says, some of the seed fell amongst thorns. And he explains that the thorns are those people who, when the seed is planted in their heart, it says the cares of this world eventually choke out the seed. He describes the cares of this world. I don't know if you caught it, but as our explanation and exposition of these three soils has been given, some of you may have noticed a comparison with what we had been studying on Wednesday nights, where we identified three enemies of the Christian. We understand the Christian fights against Satan, fights against the flesh, and fights against the worldly systems. And we have seen each of these enemies present in these three soils. Notice he says the seed that fell among thorns is the seed that when that seed is sown, the cares of this world begin to choke out the seed that has been planted. What a phrase, the cares of this world. Matthew and some of the other gospel writers will will also tag a couple of other phrases with it. They'll say the deceitfulness of riches, the cares of this world. And what does that mean? It means it's not that these people don't care about God. It's not that these people don't understand that the Bible is God's word, or it's not that they don't think these things are important. The problem is there's just too much going on. The cares of this world begin to choke out God's word. That word choke is a strong word in the Greek. It's an aggressive word. It it means to strangle or to suffocate. It's the word sympnigo. It's only used here in the parables, and it's used on that one occasion. Do you remember when the woman with the issue of blood was trying to touch Jesus, but she couldn't because the crowd was pressing in on Jesus? The King James says the crowd thronged him. What does that mean? It it means there was no room around Jesus. It it means there was no access to him. Sympnigo means to be suffocated. And he is explaining here in this parable that if we don't know how to guard our hearts, if, if we allow the cares of this world to seep in, then it's not that God can't do a work in your life. The problem is we're not giving him room to work in our life. The problem is we have too much going on. The the cares of this world, the concerns about money, the, the concerns about what's happening in our world, the concerns about everything around us. And God's saying, look, I'm trying to do something in your life. You got to give me some room to work. You got to give the word some room to grow in your life because the seed cannot grow amongst thorns. Somebody say amen if you're getting this. In Mark's account, In Mark chapter 4 and verse 19, as he describes the thorns, watch this, he says something troubling. He says simply, it's the desire for other things that choke out the world. Man, I I don't know about you. That that phrase, deceitfulness of riches, that's fine. I don't have a problem with that. Cares of this world, I think I'm okay. But this one is troubling. The desire for other things. Because it's like he leaves it open-ended. It's so vague. It's so nebulous. It's so, so general. He doesn't even say what other things. They could be good things. They're not necessarily bad things. And we need to check our hearts this morning that our desire for other things don't choke out God's work in our life. Anytime we desire anything or anyone more than God, it becomes a thorn that chokes out the word of God. All right, I got one more and then I'll get out of your way. 
There's four soils. Notice he says the seed is sown on the wayside. The seed is sown on the stony places. The seed is is sown with our third one, the thorns. Finally, we get to our fourth soil. He says, but there is some seed that falls on good ground. There is some seed that falls on good ground where it can produce a harvest. Now, as you look at this, notice only one in four produced a harvest. And it's almost alarming that there was a 25% rate of return. That means only one in four people responded. It's a picture of what happens in the kingdom, that, that there is a narrow road and few there be that find it. But that wide road, everybody's on that road. Most people are stony ground. Most people are thorns. Most people are that wayside. But, but there is a remnant where God's word can produce a harvest in our life. Here's what he says. It's those people that both hear and understand his word. In other words, time and time again throughout scriptures, Christ will place an emphasis not just on being a hearer of the word, but we are to be, come on, help me somebody. We are to be doers of the word. And so I'm glad you're hearing the word right now. I I commend you for, for receiving God's word. I commend you for reading your Bible throughout the week. I commend you for listening to sermons. But but here's the real question. Are we doing? Are we applying? Are we putting some feet to our faith? Because it's not just in the hearing. It says the moment you hear and begin to understand. The moment you hear and begin to do. The moment you hear and begin to apply what you have just received from his word. That's the moment you become good soil. Come on, I need somebody to proclaim in the chat. Would you just declare it? I'm good ground. I'm good ground for God's word to grow. I'm good ground for God's work in my life. And so as the Lord is depositing the seed of his word in our hearts, If we're going to be good ground, it's because God wants to bring forth fruit in us. As we begin this series, this has been my prayer this week. Lord, bring us to a place of fruitfulness. Even in the midst of a pandemic, even though we're doing most of our services online, we've been praying, God, right now, bring fruit in us. Make us a fruitful people. We're praying for your family destiny fellowship we're praying that there would be fruit in your home we're praying that the thief wouldn't snatch away what god is doing in this time we're praying that you'll be rooted and grounded in love we're praying that the cares of this world and everything happening in our life won't choke out the word that god has planted in your life i believe that in the middle of this pandemic god is raising up a fruitful people a people that produce fruit some 30, some 60, some 100. He's showing us that there will be different levels of fruitfulness, but here's what's important. Are you being diligent with what has been deposited in you? How do I know? How do I check? Check your heart. Are we wayside? Are we thorns? Are we stony places? Or are we good ground? And so here's my question. If you've been serving the Lord for a while, as we read these parables, we often identify with one of the soils. This this morning, I want to suggest a higher level that you don't just identify as the soil. I think it's time you start identifying as the sower. Let me say that again. Come on. You've been identifying with the soil for too long. It's time you start identifying with the sower, with the sower. Why? Because God's word has been deposited in you. So now what? Now you take that same word and you start sowing it into others. That's the next level. That not just in receiving the word, now it's time for you to impart his word. Somebody sowed the word into you. Now it's time for you to sow his word into somebody else. And let me encourage you, there will be good ground. There will be stony ground. There will be wayside. There will be thorns. But it's our job to keep on sowing. I came to tell you this morning, keep sowing, keep serving, keep giving, keep praying, keep worshiping. Come on, keep on sowing. And as you do that, guess what? You'll hit that good ground. It will produce a harvest. Our kids are going back to school. It's time to start sowing in them like never before. 
We got to make sure as they're in school, either online, maybe in person in a couple of weeks, we've got to be praying. We've got to make sure that the cares of this world don't produce thorns that are choking out the word of God in their lives. Somebody say amen. In conclusion, I want to remind you that a seed is powerful. A, a, a seed is contains the necessary DNA, the necessary elements to, pro to, to produce something powerful, to produce something great. You might just see an apple seed. Little did you know you've got an orchard at your disposal. You might just see an acorn. You might not even be aware you've got an entire forest at your disposal. For this reason, God compares his word with a seed because I don't know what it's gonna do in your life but if you can prepare the ground of your heart and let God come into your heart, let God come into your home, let God come into your life's mission, it can produce a harvest far greater than you ever expected. As we prepare to dismiss, I want to pray with you. And as we start this series, I want to pray that first and foremost today, this day, this Sunday morning, all of us would check our heart. Can we be honest and, and just check, Lord, if there's any thorns in me, remove them. God, if my roots aren't deep enough to withstand the pressure, God, help me grow roots this morning. Right now, I want to encourage you, would you stop whatever else is going on around you? I'll lead us, but I want to encourage you to pray. And as we've been sharing the word, maybe something leaped out at you and you realize, man, I need to take care of that in my life. I need to make a change in this area. Let's pray. Father, we come before you this morning in the name of your son, Jesus. I lift up every individual listening to us right now, every person agreeing with us in prayer. And God, we thank you that you love us enough to deposit and bring your seed into our hearts. But Lord, this morning, we need to check our hearts. And Father, we declare that we are good ground. Father, I ask you, help us have strong roots, Lord. Help us guard the seed that the enemy wouldn't steal it. Father, forgive us for the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, or simply desiring other things more than we desire you. And Lord, this morning we pray that your seed would produce a harvest in our lives. Lord, bring forth fruit in our homes. Bring forth fruit in our church. Bring forth fruit in our city and our nation and across this world. God, I pray, let the body of Christ be good ground. We ask you for a harvest of souls, Lord. I ask, God, that you would use us not just to be soil. Use us as sowers, God, that we would impart your word into others. Father, I pray, raise up missionaries, raise up disciple makers, raise up evangelists and those who are not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, but they won't hesitate, Lord, to share your word with others. God, we pray this in the strong name of Jesus Christ. And everybody said, amen. Thank you so much for joining us. I want to encourage you to be faithful in your giving. Uh, we've got a giving church at Destiny Fellowship, uh, but we do believe even in the midst of this pandemic that we honor the Lord with our first fruits. We honor God with our substance. Thank you, church, for being faithful. If you haven't given this week, if you haven't given uh, even this paycheck, would you take some time and go on Givelify and put the Lord first in your finances? We've been talking about seed this whole day. Why don't you sow a seed into his kingdom? either in a tithe or an offering. I also want to invite you into, uh, for this Wednesday's Bible study, it is our last installment of our series on soldiers, servants, and sons. We do this on Zoom at 730. Everyone is invited. Uh, we hope you'll join us. God bless you. Have a wonderful day.